royal palaces. Symbols of power. Royal palaces are the bricks and mortar embodiment of what it means to be royal. And prestige. To see it is to believe it. It's a veritable feast for the eyes. Packed to the rafters with incredible secrets. From royal courtships to royal births to royal marriages and scandals, the palaces have played host to all of that. In this series, we step beyond the Golden Gates. We all want to see inside the palace walls. You feel as if you were being let into a secret world. Learn how these stunning buildings were constructed. This is a mad, eclectic vision of one man. Windsor was built to do battle. It's best not to get locked in one. You don't know when somebody's going to come and let you out. Unveil their spectacular artworks. The Royal Collection is simply stunning. The story of the tiara is like a spy mystery. We can only imagine how excited the Queen must have been. Delve into their gruesome histories. Frankly, cut the head off a king. It's got to be done in a palace. And revisit recent events that have shaped the modern royal family. I could see that his legs were trapped. Camilla was one of the most unpopular women in the country. To see those images of the castle in flames, there was an emotional impact for the nation. This is The Secrets of the Royal Palaces. This time, at Highgrove, Charles risks everything for Camilla. We reveal his secret plan to win over Queen and country. Camilla was one of the most unpopular women in the country. Inside Holyrood, the true story of Mary, Queen of Scots. The poetry, the plays, the films that have been made about her extraordinary life is personified in that preserved Northwest Tower. At Hampton Court, we uncover a fake painting that could be worth a king's ransom. What if the Queen's copy was not worthless, it's actually worth in excess of 50 million pounds? We witness a bizarre outbreak of violence at St. James's Palace. Then there came this blood-curdling cry from his wounds. He shouted to his page, I am being murdered. The question was, who did it? And Prince George's moment of mayhem. We dig into the archives to discover he's not the first royal to behave badly on the balcony. History was repeating itself, and it was around 30 years before that Harry was seen on the balcony doing exactly the same thing to his cousin, Princess Beatrice. The royal family have a palace for every occasion. Windsor, a castle steeped in a millennium of royal history still in use today. Buckingham Palace, the majestic official home of the monarchy. And then there are private residences, like Prince Charles's in 1980, and turned it into a family home, an organic oasis. I think the grounds are what's important in Highgrove, and it's where Charles has invested a huge amount of his energy and identity. But behind the public images of a happy family, domestic disharmony was brewing. Camilla lived just half an hour down the road. Camilla Parker Bowles was famously the other woman, the woman of whom Diana said there are three people in our marriage, so it was a bit crowded. Camilla was this scarlet woman that pretty much the whole nation hated. When Charles and Diana separated, Camilla quickly became a regular at Pygrove. Charles's public affair and messy divorce had damaged the monarchy. And following Diana's tragic death in 1997, the family hit a new low. People were devastated by Diana's death and they blamed Camilla. Camilla was one of the most unpopular women in the country. And the Queen seemed blamed Camilla too, steadfastly refusing to acknowledge her. The Queen was distancing herself from this woman to protect the integrity of the crown and to support the throne. She was a dangerous, destabilizing influence on the throne. And so started a tale of two palaces at war over this one seemingly irreconcilable issue. At Buckingham Palace, the position was clear. Camilla was not welcome. But at high Charles was determined to follow his heart. A rift developed that threatened the future of the monarchy. Camilla was, as he famously put it to one of the Queen's aides, non-negotiable. Charles hired a new PR guru and embarked on a mission to change public perceptions. Outdoorsy Camilla was given a fashion makeover. She started to wear skirt suits. Her hair was styled. 
These small things just began to build this image of an appropriate royal companion. Charles began to be seen out with Camilla. The tide of public opinion was turning, but the palace would not be so easily swayed. There were some quite senior figures at Buckingham Palace who wanted no Camilla at all, ever. It was absolutely vital that his mother should accept her, and it was also absolutely vital that the British public should accept her. A full-blown constitutional crisis was brewing. In 1998, Charles's 50th birthday became key. A number of events were planned, and the guest lists would be telling. Up first, at Buckingham Palace, a formal reception hosted by the Queen. But Camilla was excluded. If you're not actually married or at least engaged to someone, they're not generally invited to big royal family events. Everything at that time was viewed by Charles as a snub. They viewed any setback with considerable hostility and they blamed it on the courtiers, the people around the Queen, who were unprepared to change. Then at Highgrove, on Charles's actual birthday, there was a private party. Camilla, by now very much at home there, played hostess. The Queen and Prince Philip stayed away. I think the fact that the Queen didn't go is quite significant. She felt she was being boxed in and pushed into something by Charles's media handlers. She knew at some stage she and Camilla would have to break bread, but it was too soon. It's been said Prince Charles was particularly hurt by the Queen not attending that party. Charles was desperate to break the deadlock. He wanted to engineer a meeting away from prying eyes. Highgrove would be the perfect location if he could get the Queen to accept. Two years later, he saw his chance. In 2000, Charles held a birthday party for his cousin, King Constantine of Greece, and he invited the Queen. He also invited Camilla, and the Queen knew perfectly well that Camilla would be at the party. It wasn't at Buckingham Palace or Windsor or Sandringham. It was at Charles's favorite place. The party was to be at Highgrove, where Camilla was by now completely at home. Buckingham Palace is known as the home of royal pomp, pageantry, and diplomacy. 400 miles away, its Scottish counterpart is not windswept Edinburgh Castle, but the palace of Holyrood House. And it serves an important ceremonial role to this day. Holyrood is perhaps one of the great forgotten palaces. It's the seat of the Scottish First Minister, but it, in fact, is a royal palace. Each summer, the Queen's official residence in Scotland becomes the focus of a traditional royal festival. For one week every year, the Queen goes to Scotland, and it's called Royal Week. She bases herself in the Palace of Holyrood House, and she loves that week. And I think the people of Scotland love seeing her. This celebration of Scottish and royal culture includes a ceremony in which the Queen is given the key to the city of Edinburgh. But behind all the fun, the backdrop has always struck me as vaguely terrifying. Because you're looking at a massive building with enormous buttressed angled turrets and small windows, parapets. It is a castle. It's called a palace, but in fact, it's, it's a defended building. It's got all the paraphernalia of a Bram Stoker Gothic novel. Ruin, dating back to 1128, that holds a clue to Holyrood's humble beginnings. Holyrood Palace was built next to a once thriving abbey church. It's a great medieval building, uh, one of the primary churches in Scotland, named after the Holy Rood, after the, the Holy Cross. The abbey grew over the centuries and had a guest house when members of the royal family visited. But over time, as the power of the church was dwarfed by that of the state, the Abbey's role dwindled and the site as a royal residence increased. By 1501, the Abbey became such a popular destination for visiting royalty that a palace was built directly in front of it. Over time, monarchs came and went and the palace was renovated and rebuilt. When you arrive at Holyrood House, you are presented with an image of unity. The thing is, it wasn't one unified building campaign. Two towers dominate the structure. They may look like twins, but under closer inspection, they reveal architectural secrets. 
you notice that on the left, there are heraldic panels set in the walls and you've got a gun placement. On the right, all the windows are nice and neat and instead of being fired at, you've got a neat front door with a fan light that offers you a way in. There are two very different things happening at the two phases of construction there and it tells a big story about Scotland's history. While the South West Tower was part of a later makeover, the heavily defended original tower was built in the reign of James V of Scotland, when the threat from across the border was very real. England was never far from war with Scotland. Well, who's sitting down in England who has real ambitions and designs on the Scottish throne? None other than Henry VIII. So this is a place that has to not only look after itself as a building, but also the monarchy within it. And so the construction of this thing as a defensible set of chambers, they come from the late 1520s, early 1530s, about the same time that Henry VIII built St. James's Palace. Yes, in comparison with other royal residences, it's pretty brutish. It's there for a function, to protect the monarch, for goodness sake. And does it really look that hardcore when you compare it to Edinburgh Castle up there, exposed in the old town on a great lump of rock? No, give me Holyrood any day. Coming up on Secrets of the Royal Palaces, at Holyrood, Mary, Queen of Scots' chambers are the scene of a bloody murder. It's where tourists flock. It's very much at the heart of the story and testament to the significance of that period of history. And could Charles break? Very few words. And I think that she would be very guarded at first with Mrs. Parker Bowles. Britain's famous royal palaces bring in almost three million visitors from across the globe each year. Along with favourites, Buckingham Palace and Windsor Castle, Holyrood in Edinburgh is among the most popular royal palaces. Holyrood House, the Queen's official residence in Scotland, has one of the bloodiest histories of all palaces, and that was because of the reign of Mary, Queen of Scots. The oldest part of the palace is the 16th century Northwest Tower. Here, up a narrow winding staircase, are chambers that still hold Mary's secrets. Mary, Queen of Scots, is one of the most infamous Scottish figures and probably the most famous Scottish queen. The poetry, the operas, the plays, the films that have been made about her extraordinary life, but it's sort of personified in that preserved Northwest Tower. Original features, like the ornate oak ceiling, survive from Mary's torrid time here. Now, Mary, Queen of Scots, she really chose some of the worst husbands in royal history. I know there's competition, but she chose some baddies. Following the death of her first husband, the young King of France, Mary married Lord Darnley and fell pregnant. But Darnley was not to be trusted. Lord Darnley, almost as soon as he married her, started turning against her, plotting against her, and really trying to seize power from her. One of the defining moments of her reign is this cold-blooded murder instigated by her husband, Darnley. 8 p.m., Saturday the 9th of March, 1566. Mary was dining in her chambers with her ladies and her private secretary and great favorite, David Rizzio. You know, she was heavily pregnant. Then suddenly, Darnley and loads of Scottish laws break into Mary's room and they seize Rizzio. Mary, I mean, she's terrified. She's six months pregnant, one man weighs a gun at her pregnant stomach. Darnley and the Lords are jealous of Rizzio. They drag him away from Mary. In front of her eyes, he's murdered by not just one or two, but 56 stab wounds dragged across, I think, the bedchamber floor, tossed down the stairs. It was a red herring, the whole Rizzio thing. It was Mary they wanted. The Lords wanted to take Mary prisoner and steal power and put her baby on the throne. Mary is under arrest. Her beautiful palace of Holyrood that she has loved and decorated with her tapestries and all her furniture, it is now her prison. Eventually, Darnley relented and helped Mary escape. A year later, marriage at Holyrood, but no happy ending. She was deposed and she fled into England in the hope that Elizabeth would help her. Instead, she was imprisoned for 19 years and finally executed. 
the tower has been preserved and the tower is very much synonymous with Mary Queen of Scots and indeed that tragic murder. And in many ways, it's this iconic site in Scottish royal history. To this day, they sort of invite you to look for the bloodstains. It's almost like a badge of honour that this castle lived. It was a proper castle that earned its stripes where blood was shed. Holyrood Palace is not the only royal residence with a history of marital problems. At Highgrove, Prince Charles had invited his mother to a birthday party for King Constantine of Greece, and Camilla would be there, not just as a guest, but effectively as hostess. The Queen was going to find it very difficult to decline an invitation to King Constantine's party, and that meant she'd had to go literally step inside Highgrove, which by then was very much Camilla's domain. As a hundred discreet VIP guests arrived at the Orchard House Highgrove for an organic barbecue lunch, the stage was set for this make or break summit. The Queen and Camilla had not spoken for many years. Even those in the know couldn't predict quite how the Queen would react. I think the meeting with the Queen and Camilla for the first time would have been very formal. The Queen watches very closely. The Queen is a lady of very few words. And I think that she would be very guarded at first with Mrs Parker Bowles. I believe that they shook hands, Camilla curtsied, they had a brief chit-chat together, and then they went their separate ways to different tables at the lunch. Though secretive, the Highgrove meeting was clearly a success. What they talked about, what happened, we don't know very much, but it was a significant moment in that whole campaign to make Mrs. Parker Bowles, as she still then was, acceptable to the public and ultimately a potential bride for the Prince of Wales. From that moment on, Camilla began to be seen at royal events. In the Royal Box, Buckingham Palace, at Balmoral and Sandringham. Prince Charles's strategy had worked. They appreciate her in a way for the stability she's brought Charles, the calmness. So much so that after a civil ceremony in 2005, their marriage was blessed in St George's Chapel, Windsor, with the Queen and Prince Philip in attendance. Camilla has been hugely important to him for many, many years. And he... Two months later, Camilla hit the royal big time with her first ever appearance on the famous Buckingham Palace balcony. And at last, the tale of two palaces was over, and harmony was restored in the House of Windsor. These days, nearby Kensington Palace is a model of gentility and decorum. But during the reign of William of Orange and Mary II, it gained a surprising reputation as a debauched and downright dirty party palace. Crowned in 1689, William and Mary wanted a home outside polluted London. So off they went to Kensington, which was then a lovely country village. And they bought Kensington House to turn into a palace. And that meant receptions, that meant dinners, and that meant balls. Balls were huge occasions, 600 people would turn up, and no one did washing in the 17th century, early 18th century. It was seen as bad for the body. So no one washed themselves, no one washed their clothes, and worst of all, there were actually no official loos. So what you actually see are people, when they go to the ball, just relieving themselves in corners. Uh, if there's a bucket, all the better. But if there's no bucket, just go to the loo. And, you know, actually you couldn't see. So, you know, if you're, you're a lady in one of those great big dresses, she can just be standing there and you wouldn't realise that she's a weed on the floor. So William and Mary moved from disgusting, polluted London and now they managed to do Kensington with the smell of everyone weeing at the balls. And so there were signs put up saying no pissing to tell people hold it in or find somewhere else to go. Do not go in the corner of the ballroom. One of the finest art collections of all the palaces is at Hampton Court and was curated and purchased by Charles I. Charles had an incredible love of the arts that had been really instilled in him by his father James I. He saw the power of having a prestigious art collection, how it could project this image of the monarchy as supremely cultured and powerful. It was Charles who invested in the Renaissance and Baroque masterpieces that hang pride of place on palace walls today. 
1629, Charles added substantially to the collection when he spent £18,000, a huge amount of money, on 400 works of art from the Italian Gonzaga family collection. Eight years later, he bought another prestigious piece, The Calling of Saints Peter and Andrew by maverick Italian painter Caravaggio. The painting shows Jesus as he meets the future apostles Peter and Andrew while they're still fishermen. It's got those dramatic effects of light and shade, but also this is the moment of greatest psychological tension as the brothers are just about to decide to leave their life behind, drop their nets and follow Jesus. Questioning its authenticity. Charles I bought this painting, believing it was an original Caravaggio. And perhaps because it was such a good picture, it was copied at the time. There are only 50 paintings surviving by Caravaggio. So for this to have been an original, it really wasn't felt that that was the case. The picture was dramatically demoted and it was now thought to be one of those copies. And that view prevailed for about 350 years. For centuries, the picture lay hidden in a dusty storeroom in Hampton Court Palace. Until one day, something changed. The story goes back to 1987 when an Italian curator suddenly asked a bold question, what if the Queen's copy was in fact the lost original? The painting was taken in for conservation work. It was very dirty. There were layers and layers of varnish that had built up. It took six years of detailed conservation work to find an answer. On closer inspection, evidence mounted. Could this be the lost original? Caravaggio was quite unusual. He would paint straight onto the canvas, but he would etch in an underdrawing. And as the conservators looked closely, they could see around the face that these etched lines were there. There's the speed and the confidence of the brush strokes, which mean that this must be the real deal got a real energy to it that a lot of his contemporaries just weren't able to match. This had to be a Caravaggio. The palace had unearthed a rare art treasure and their findings stunned the art world. Suddenly in 2006 there's a dramatic announcement. The painting really is by Caravaggio and it's not worthless, it's actually worth probably something in excess of 50 million pounds. This was a really incredible discovery. It's the sort of thing that only happens once or twice in a generation. We can only imagine how excited the Queen must have been. The idea that a Caravaggio painting was hidden in plain sight, it's a dream come true. Coming up, we discover the mysterious origins of Windsor Castle's Order of the Garter. For me, the Order of the Garter always stirs up memories of the Da Vinci Code and Dan Brown, you know, secret sect. And inside Holyrood, everything is not what it seems. Suddenly, you're in a different world than what you saw outside. It opens you up to a world of 17th century confidence and extravagance. In Edinburgh, the Palace of Holyrood House has all the formidable features of a mighty fortress. You're in a different world than what you saw outside. You go up an open well staircase. It's got light streaming into the middle of it from not one, but two tiers of windows. Uh, the white walls bounce the light around. The great plaster ceilings above you create a sense of looking up into the heavens. And the walls are lined with 16th and 17th century tapestries. They're rare and expensive things. And they tell you that you are past the point of defense. You have entered into the protected realm. It's a beautiful 17th century ensemble of rooms, as good as anywhere in Britain. Opulent interiors were born out of a period of great turmoil. Holyrood had been gutted by an occupying Republican army, led by one Oliver Cromwell. We know that Oliver Cromwell billets his men there and doesn't really treat it with due respect. For crying out loud, this guy's a Republican. It's all about the barrel of the gun and the good word of the Lord. And he's not about the sort of flash symbols of monarchy. Far from it. When the monarchy was restored, new King Charles II wanted to make a statement with a bold reinvention of Holyrood, hiring renowned classical architect Sir William Bruce. It was he who 
complemented the old tower with its symmetrical counterpart. And behind that, he set out a courtyard around which was a succession of state rooms. You start off at the top of the stairs with a presence chamber and then go through to a privy chamber of increasing richness. And the privy chamber holds yet more scandalous surprises. There are works of art from some Dutch masters and you'll see things like naked bathers by a Dutch artist called Jacob de Vet. Um, this is so racy that Queen Victoria couldn't see it, so it was covered with a mirror glass when she visited in the middle of the 19th century. Charles II, just like his father, understood the power and prestige that art can convey. The most striking room in his redesigned palace is the 44 meter long Great Gallery, lined with portraits of real and legendary kings of Scotland. Holyrood is obviously the place where great, important visitors are hosted, great state occasions are held. Each year, the Queen returns to host world leaders, bestow honours and meet members of the public, ensuring that this historic setting remains very much a part of the monarchy today. Another royal residence that retains an important ceremonial role is St James's Palace in London. It's here that the next king will be proclaimed. And St James's Palace has seen some of the most remarkable events in royal... In 1810, it was a scene of a bloody murder. Ernest, Duke of Cumberland, son and potential heir of George III, became embroiled along with his servants Joseph Sellis and Cornelius Neal in a bizarre outbreak of violence one night at the palace. May 1810, the Duke of Cumberland was asleep and then there came this blood-curdling cry from his rooms. He shouted to his page, Neil, I am being murdered. Cornelius Neil, his valet, rushes in and tries to work out what's happened. And he saw that the Duke, well, he's had his head split open. Someone had hit him over the head with his own sabre, but they'd used the blunt part of the blade. So it hadn't killed him, but he was sort of knocked out. His head was split open. And the question was, who did it? And they're looking for the Duke's valet, Celis. And he's not there, but his slippers are found in the Duke's cupboard. And then they find Celis in his room, and his throat is slashed, he's pouring with blood. He's dead on the floor. Hmm, who killed him? An investigation was launched into what had occurred. There were an awful lot of attempts at slurring, at blackening Celis's character. The official conclusion was that Celis had attacked the Duke and then killed himself. But the suggestion that the Duke had been involved in a murder, in a homosexual love triangle, in the killing of his own valet, that would taint him and would dog him for the rest of his life. Historically, being a monarch or heir to the throne was a risky business. And so kings, like Edward III at Windsor, surrounded themselves with strong walls and loyal men. In 1348, Edward, who was obsessed with Arthurian legends, founded the most noble order of the Garter, a mysterious brotherhood of knights that lives on to this day. The Order of the Garter is the highest order of chivalry in England, and in fact, it's the oldest order anywhere in the world that's been in continuous existence. It's a group of 24 people who are fiercely loyal and swear to protect the king and country. The rituals of this ancient order have been passed down through the generations. Every year on the traditional Garter Day, the Queen, knights and ladies process through Windsor Castle to St George's Chapel to attend a special service. It's members of the royal family dressing up in the most ridiculous costumes with hats, with feathers, processing down to Windsor Castle. It is a picture opportunity for the wives mainly, like Camilla and Kate, to laugh at their husbands. Beyond, I don't think we really, as a nation, have much idea of what it's all about. For me, the Order of the Garter, I don't know quite why, always stirs up memories of the Da Vinci Code and Dan Brown's secret sect. Since the earliest records of the Order were destroyed by fire, little is known about its origin and purpose. The spiritual home of the Order has remained St George's Chapel, Windsor. 
the banner of every living member is displayed here. These are the flags of the knights and ladies of the Order of the Garter. Now, when a new knight or lady gets invested, they get given their own heraldic flag. Today, the Queen chooses members from a variety of backgrounds in recognition of their public service. And new banners are drawn up by the College of Arms. The flags are five foot square. They are all handmade and meticulously hand painted. And they're full of personal symbols that relate specifically to the history and life of the person who's just been brought into the order. Mary Peters, for instance, who won the pentathlon in the 1972 Olympics, has the Olympic rings in the center of her flag. John Major has a portcullis, the symbol of the Houses of Parliament, and on top of that are three cricket balls to reflect his passion for the game. The 24 loyal knights and ladies are joined in the order by another very select group. Some members of the royal family act as extra members, and the Queen Mother was one of those. The royal standard of Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, combines the royal standard of her husband, King George VI, with her own family coat of arms, the Bows Lions. So she has lions represented, but also three bows. The Queen Mother's standard hung in the chapel for 66 years. Upon her death, it was taken down to make way for a new member. Prince Charles, who was particularly close to his grandmother, couldn't bear to be parted from it. Anyone who goes to Clarence House, one of the first things that they will see as they come in through the front door is the banner hanging there. Every time he saw it, it would act as a reminder of his beloved grandmother. And so this national treasure continues to fly inside its new palace home. Still to come, we discover a disturbing royal grave robbery at St George's Chapel, Windsor. If you thought that the only Tomb Raider out there was Lara Croft, well, there's another one. And that was the Prince Regent, future King George IV. And we catch royal kids behaving badly at Buckingham Palace. George starts belting his best rendition of God Save the Queen. Suddenly, Savannah realises... Royal palaces are places of sanctuary for kings and queens in life and in death. St George's Chapel at Windsor Castle is the burial site of 10 monarchs. This number includes Charles I, who was executed. But the final resting place of his severed head remained a mystery. Until 1813, when the Prince Regent embarked on a quest for answers. If you thought that the only Tomb Raider out there was Lara Croft, well, there's another one, and that was the Prince Regent, future King George IV. The Prince Regent had become obsessed by Charles I, executed in 1649. Was Charles I's head attached or not? Had it been sewn back on? And this question became the equivalent of that crossword clue you just can't solve. So the Prince Regent asks the royal physician, Henry Halford, to go down into the royal vault in St George's Chapel, Windsor, and look at the grave of Charles I. Together, they venture down to the crypt to look for the body. Henry Halford opens the coffin and finds the body of Charles I wrapped in cloth and smeared with some greasy, unctuous matter. He takes the cloth off the body and says, actually, the head still remains. It is blackened and the nose has lost its cartilage. But he says, this is definitely Charles I because it looks just like Charles I in the bust. And then he gets out the head and he holds it up and he can tell, he says, that it's been sawn off by a big blow. And that solves the question for the Prince Regent. Charles I's head was buried with him. And you'd think, now, poor Charles I can be put back to bed and really rest in peace at Windsor Castle St George's Chapel for the rest of the days. But no, Henry Halford has found this all rather thrilling and decides to take a souvenir for himself. So he takes the fourth vertebra of Charles I's neck, puts it in his pocket and saves it and he passes it round at dinner parties. So thanks to the Prince Regent's crazy obsession with whether or not Charles I's head was on or off, St George's Chapel at Windsor Castle becomes the scene of a real grave robbery. The fate of Charles I at the hands of Parliament 
is a stark reminder that the monarchy depends upon the will of the people. Today's royal family is more focused than ever on allowing the public into their palaces and their lives. The Queen has always said they must be seen to be believed, and that is the central point of her ethos for the monarchy. They must be seen in public. Since the reign of Queen Victoria, the balcony at Buckingham Palace has been the stage for iconic royal appearances. The Queen's coronation, and more recently, William and Kate stealing a kiss on their wedding day. Not only is it a symbol of the British monarchy, it's kind of become a symbol for Great Britain itself. Such is the significance of this hallowed platform. Even palace insiders are in awe of it. I've actually been in the room where the balcony is. I find it quite daunting thinking how many royals have come into this room and walked onto that balcony. I will assure everyone that I did resist from kind of doing the, the kind of little wave when I was at the window, even though I wanted to. Being up on such a stage is the ultimate test for any royal, especially the younger generations. Of course, the balcony had one of the shots uh, of William and Kate's wedding, and I'm not talking about the kiss. It was the lovely little bridesmaid who looked really cheesed off, her head in her hands, at having to stand out on that balcony for so long. June 2018, on the Queen's official birthday, thousands lined the mall to see the trooping of the colour and to catch a glimpse of the royals on the balcony. It's one of the few times each year that the whole royal family can get together. You know, more than 40 people at times. The Queen with her children, her grandchildren, and even her great-grandchildren. They play the national anthem to appreciate the monarch, essentially. Of course, the crowds will sing along, but the royals, they don't. They stand to attention and respect the anthem. At the front of the balcony, Prince George was next to his older cousin, Savannah Phillips. The royals are being very stoic when suddenly Savannah starts conducting the band. Suddenly, George starts belting out his best rendition of God Save the Queen. Prince George started to sing along. He's clearly been learning the words. Suddenly, Savannah realises, gosh, we're royals. We shouldn't be doing this. She knew that actually the royals don't sing along. Those images go round the world. It's what the royal photographers are looking for because it's something different and it's something relatable. George and Savannah's antics may seem like a one-off, but a deep dive into the archives reveals that they were following in some famous footsteps. Well, the funny thing about this is that history was repeating itself and it was around 30 years before that Harry was seen on the balcony doing exactly the same thing to his cousin, Princess Beatrice. You know, Harry was a joker and still is. And younger children like Beatrice and others are the same. I think it's what children do. The following year, George and Savannah were uh, separated, and I think that's probably the parents having a quiet agreement beforehand that may... I think what's lovely about this scene is that these children are brought up around the Queen and princes living in palaces and castles, but there's actually a childhood innocence about them. It doesn't matter if you're a future king. You can still get bossed around by your cousins. It became one of these iconic royal moments that will live long in the memory. Next time on Secrets of the Royal Palaces. Of whom Diana said there are three people in our marriage, so it was a bit crowded. Camilla was this scarlet woman that pretty much the whole nation hated. When Charles and Diana separated, Camilla quickly became a regular at Pygrove. Charles's public affair and messy divorce had damaged the monarchy. And following Diana's tragic death in 1997, the family hit a new low. People were devastated by Diana's death and they blamed Camilla. Camilla was one of the most unpopular women in the country. And the Queen seemed blamed Camilla too, steadfastly refusing to acknowledge her. The Queen was distancing herself from this woman to protect the integrity of the crown and to support the throne. She was a dangerous, destabilizing influence on the throne. And so started a tale of two palaces at war over this one seemingly irreconcilable issue.